Adventures of a Gem Trader by Edward Bristol, read by Troy W. Hudson, produced for Wildfish Audio, copyright 2014. Summary of Book 1 On my previous gem-buying trip to Madagascar, I was abducted by the secret police and forced into their service. I found myself in a tight spot during an attempt on President Andrea Rani's life. In the end, however, I was lucky. Not only did I earn a good retainer, but more importantly, I met Lizzie, who quit her job on the president's staff. Together, we fled Madagascar on the corporate jet of One Oar and under protection of its CEO, Peter Pestina. Book 2. Monkey Business in Kenya. Chapter 1. Nairobi, Kenya, 2001. The One Oar jet taxied to the Yomo Kenyatta International Airport terminal around noon. Peter personally walked us to the private gate and said, If you need me, I'm open for business. If there's a finer promise to hear from a gym loving Fortune 500 CEO, well, I can't think of it. Lizzie gave him a hug and a kiss, and I shook his hand again. Good luck in New York, Lizzie called as we passed the gate and waved, but Peter only waggled his head. After the leather sofas on Peter's jet, the Nairobi airport looked even shabbier than usual. Ducking under the cold and harsh light, we strutted towards the customs barrier. Even on a commercial flight, Lizzie and I would have attracted attention, but coming alone from a sleek private jet, a small battalion of custom and immigration officers in worn-out uniforms awaited us in eager silence. We presented our luggage and passports. They didn't bother to ask if we had anything to declare, but motioned us straight away into a separate interrogation room. First, they opened Lizzie's oversized Samsonite. The team leader, his face reminding me of a carp fish, dug through Lizzie's lingerie, while the others gawked at each item, whispering and smirking. Lizzie watched them, her strong arms folded over her chest, patiently first, but with contempt and then anger rising in her face. I tried to make eye contact, but she ignored me. Finally, she put her hands on her hips, elbows spread wide, drew a deep breath, and in a sharp tone addressed the carp officer with a staccato of short questions. Now, my Swahili is limited, and I never got to ask what exactly she said. However, it was very effective. The carp froze, dropped her underwear, and blushed. His team stopped laughing, examined their fingernails, tucked at their uniforms, and uh, rearranged their name tags. He closed Lizzie's case and then turned to my old suitcase covered with stickers, tags, and stamps from all continents. Anything to declare? He asked me. Yep, I have gemstones in there. I opened my knapsack and showed the zip bags from Madagascar. He fished for one of the bags, held it up, and his eyes glimmered Christmas. So far, all is planned. Those gems would keep him away from the 50,000 in various currencies hidden in the inner pockets of my jacket. They spread the gym bags over the table, examined the stones, and commented as if they had any clue what they were. I kept my eyes on their fingers to make sure no stone went missing. After a short discussion, the team leader said, You need to declare. I nodded friendly. Sure, I know. With Lizzie by my side, oxytoxin levels at record high, I was all loving kindness, a beacon of compassion. These poor fellows, they did a terrible job for little pay. They, too, had to make a living, and well, I was willing to contribute to society. I had already checked the room. No surveillance. No CCTV. Not yet. Not in Africa. The carp pulled a thick stack of customs forms from a drawer. I parried his move with an equally thick stack of small dollar bills from my pocket. This was a routine process. Pay up front to avoid filling out endless forms, only to pay later anyways— a shortcut that saves time and is often cheaper. That day, however, things were different. Lizzie frowned, grabbed the dollar bills from my hand, and stuffed them back into my pocket. We do this in good order, she said, and began lecturing the terrified officers in Swahili. They argued. She threatened and pointed fingers. I groaned, but Lizzie did not budge. Obstinately, she began filling out the custom forms. Come on, I whispered. We'll pay this way or that. Let's just get it over with. The suggestion earned me an angry glance, and you should not support this. Whether we give it to them or to their government, it's the same, just quicker. No, it's not, she snarled. You should know better. 
I doubted that the Kenyan government would make more efficient use of our money than these poor officers, but considered the argument unwinnable. In the end, after a lot of paperwork, bickering, many stamps and signatures, we paid $870 in taxes. Lizzie insisted on a receipt. It took another half hour to issue an official paper documenting that they had received $870 in cash. It was obvious they had not used a formal receipt in a long while. When we finally dropped into a taxi, night was falling. Lizzie directed the driver through Nairobi's inner city and then deep into a residential mid-class area. Simple one-family houses, some fenced with gardens, others just standing in the mud. Many had tiled roofs set on solid concrete. Most had electricity and running water, unsafe to drink, perhaps, and the power would die regularly, but satellite dishes beamed everywhere. Not street lamps, but grocery stores and tea houses lit the sidewalks, shared by many dogs, children, goats, and grandmas sitting on stools, sipping tea, watching the traffic. The taxi stopped. That's it, Lizzie said with an apologetic smile. Her family lived in a classic rectangular cube of unfinished concrete with the irons sticking out from the top. As common, the family must have planned for two floors, but the money ran out so they had moved in anyways, hoping that one day they would be able to continue upwards. Are you sure? Lizzie asked, not for the first time. Of course, I said, without hesitation. Frankly, I would have preferred a nice hotel, but I knew she had to stay with her family and I didn't want to leave her side. Not at all. The taxi driver honked once, then again. Screams and yells as people streamed from all sides. Four generations hugged, patted, cried upon, and kissed Lizzie. I stood aside, shy and forgotten, for the moment. Then Lizzie emerged from the throng, pulling a roundish lady in a white nightgown behind. Mama, she said, and a hush fell over the crowd. This is my friend Edward. We met in Tana. Please, welcome him. Lizzie's mom leaned back and ogled me with suspicion. She had Lizzie's features, but without the tall Caucasian part. For a moment, she hesitated, frowning, perhaps remembering Lizzie's father, the Russian ambassador. Finally, she decided to like me and bestowed big, wet kisses on my cheeks and forehead. No further questions asked. We followed Mom into her living room, and she pressed us into the only two chairs— a small TV glowed from a battered cupboard. A staircase climbed to the roof. A sofa stood without legs. Many blankets and some pillows lay scattered on the floor. Somebody whisked a folding table between Lizzie and me, and Mum loaded it with food. Dozens of people stood along the walls, peppering Lizzie with questions while staring at me. Lizzie ate sparsely and talked a lot. I could only guess what was said and smile politely, sweating over the spicy food. At times, it's very comfortable not to understand a language, being able to relax and observe without questions and small talk. After I refused a second refill of pink sugar cake for dessert, Mum helped us to a few buckets of water at the well behind the house. Finally, and with a broad smile, Mum showed us to the only separate room. The bed was tousled. A candle and a battered romance novel lay on a side table. I sleep with the kids. Mum said in Russian-accented English, then winked and pecked my cheek. I protested, but Mum was adamant. She would sleep on the floor with the kids. Lizzie recommended to accept. I stood, blushing, but thankful, because in case you've never tried, sleeping on naked concrete is tough, especially sober. Mum chased everybody out, and we were left alone with a bed for the first time in our short relation. However, privacy, it's a relative word in Africa. The room had no door, only a curtain. Behind it, I heard Mum complimenting the last guests into the night and ordering the family to sleep. Lizzie changed into silk panties and a tank top. I sat on the bed's edge, breathless, staring at her shoulder line. Perhaps I would dare ask for a hotel tomorrow. Her smile, ever so sweet. My heartbeat, ever so loud. Sixteen years old or twelve, dying of desire. But kids giggle just behind the curtain, and Mum was dishing out wax, chasing them to their sleeping places. I shook my head and mouthed, No, I can't. Lizzie waved her hand, smiling, groped under the bed, clicked a button, and a local radio station filled the room with Afropop. I glanced at the thin curtain, but Lizzie whispered, Don't worry, as she blew out the candle and pulled me on the mattress. At times, life is sweet. So sweet. I awoke to dogs barking, stretched, and felt for Lizzie. 
She was sitting against the wall, legs pulled up, quietly watching me with a sincere expression. Since the curtain was still closed, I snuggled up, but she called something in Swahili, probably, he's awake, and immediately a tsunami of kids streamed through the door and onto the bed, trampoline jumping, screaming and laughing, filling the bed with a turmoil of black bodies poking and pulling at the blankets. I clutched my t-shirt, pulling it down, barely covering my personal items, and retreated into one corner, groping for my shorts. Lizzie swung her pillow and whacked one little kid straight off the bed. Others fought back. Under the bed sheet, I scrambled into my pants just as Mom stormed in and threw herself onto Lizzie. The bed moaned. I cowered into one corner, shying, until Mom grabbed me for a long row of her wet kisses. Later, we went outside where they had set up a table under a tree in the garden and began to fuss over us. World class. Tea, food, coffee, and questions, and more tea, and more questions. Then the visits began. At least a hundred people queued through the garden that day. Anybody remotely related to Lizzie had the right to visit and interview us. Mom functioned as a gatekeeper, and two athletic cousins did crowd control, leading guests and small troops under our tree, sitting them down, and making sure they left after their allocated time slot. To each visitor, Lizzie handed out gifts. Some had a story to tell that led to an extremely urgent cash need for school tuitions, water bills, or medicine. Lizzie then discreetly rolled a few bills into the petitioner's hand, and off they went. Next, to others, we dispensed shampoo, toys, pocket calculators, pencils, maps of Africa, key holders, mostly PR giveaways from Madagascar. Lizzie had a suitcase full of the stuff. When the case was empty and still more visitors came, we began to give away everything else we didn't really need, like used airline tickets, old clothes, the empty suitcase, batteries, everything, anything. Lizzie also sponsored refill after refill of Mum's fridge for the visitors. Soft drinks, snacks, neon-colored sugar cakes, masses of ugali ugali, grilled mutton, later, beer and local whiskey. During a quiet moment, Lizzie said, We can't stay long. Too much attention. No good. I nodded. Nairobi, or as the expats call it, Nairobi, was not a safe place, at least not if you possessed anything of value. Sooner or later, the ripples of our generosity would stir the mud beyond family protection, and we had to be gone before the bad guys came to ask for giveaways. News of the Muzungu, who stayed with the assistant president of Madagascar, was spreading. How long? I asked. Let's make a plan. We decided to stay two more days and then take the train to Mombasa and there rent a car. We could drive down the south coast, stop where we liked, and loosely aim for Voy, where Lizzie's uncle mined for Savarite, a gem combining the best of diamond and emerald. If you want to hear God laugh, they say, make a plan. The following afternoon, a shudder ran through the streets. Screams of surprise and fear pierced a sudden, unnatural quiet. We sat up, listening. Mum motioned through the window. Haraka! Haraka! Her face anxious. What's going on? I asked, but Lizzie just got up when we ran inside. A crowd had gathered around the small TV, whispering, shushing one another. We stepped up, pushed through. I squinted at the fuzzy black and white screen and frowned. They were watching some odd disaster flick. An airplane flew into a burning skyscraper. Then my knees buckled. It was CNN. For days, we sat numb, incredulous, angry and ignorant, thinking of people we knew, friends, worrying about humanity on an unprecedented level. I tried Peter's cell. No lines available. I tried a friend in London. No lines available. The world stood still. Ironically, for the time being, we felt safe at Lizzie's family and decided to stay longer. Chapter 2 Ten days later, we sat on the old colonial train heading to Mombasa. We had left Nairobi with five hours delay. Standard delay. In the worn-out but romantic restaurant car, I asked Lizzie, How much money do you have, all in all? She stared, slightly frowning, and asked, Why? I pulled out a pen, counted for a few moments, and jotted down 80K on the back of our daily menu. That's what I have, in dollars. I pushed the menu over the table, plus 110 k worth and gems are rough. Perhaps we throw our money in one pot and start a business. Together. Lizzie leaned back, folded her arms, mustering me as if we had just met. 
For a moment, my heart went cold and my breath stuttered. But then her eyes sparkled and she smiled. What about your, um, what you did before, she asked. Well, no strings, nothing really. I was buying here, selling somewhere, nowhere. Did it pay? Yes, it, it did mostly. But then I was always broke on a high level, but always broke. Okay for me, but for, you know, with two, like, um, I don't know. I quit stuttering and probably blushed. Don't say it, she helped with a smile. The waiter slammed the main course on our tables. How about you, I asked. Do you want to go back into politics, admin? She watched the passing Savannah. Well, that's what I've studied for, to make a difference. And so, you know, but she blinked. It's all a question of alternatives. Back in Tana, we were lucky. Normally, I would have had to buckle under and smile and feel sick. With a resolute face, she took my pen, counted, and came up with 65. I also own a nice piece of beach land south of Diani. My father bought it for me. Three acres. It's worth a good deal more, but I wouldn't want to sell it, especially not now. Yes, beach land is nice. Don't sell it. I sip for my water. That makes 145 in cash. Enough to start something. She held my gaze for a moment, then we stared out of the window, over the endless wilderness, with the sun gleaming orange on the horizon. We didn't speak for a while. As the waiter cleared our table, Lizzie said, That land in Diani? There are two houses. One is occupied, leased out long term. The other is free, but no furniture. I thought of my huge but empty apartment in Berlin, a rental I shared with an always broke DJ. Berlin was dead cheap those days. Lots of real estate in the communist east. How about Berlin? I have a big flat there. Good infrastructure. Nice city. Lizzie shot me a glance that was half irritated and half apologetic. I only have a Kenyan passport. More than four weeks tourist visa is difficult for me. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I said and meant it. Not your fault, she waved her hand. No Russian passport? No, Dad was not official, remember? I nodded slowly, a sudden lump in my throat. Then we have to stay in Africa. Her eyes glittered a challenge. If you want to be with me, yes, we must stay here. Is that very terrible? Africa wasn't my dream for permanent residency. I glanced at Lizzie, and she knew. With a sarcastic smile, she added, Or you must marry me. No, I will not marry you for immigration, I said, too loud and with a pained laugh turning the heads of our fellow diners. Any other reasons? She asked, a sharp edge in her voice. To marry you or not to marry you? She reached over the table and quickly punched me between the ribs with her knuckles in kung fu style. A glass of wine spilled. I groaned. Everybody stared. A waiter ran to clean the mess. That would then be marital abuse, I tried to laugh. It's not funny, she snarled. I took her hand and whispered, no. Sorry, it's, it's not funny, really. My mother married for immigration and regretted it every time. It's a bad omen. She tried to pull her hand away, but unconvincingly, so I held tight. Lizzie, please, listen, I begged, terrified by the ugly direction my well-meant business proposal had taken. I can think of many good reasons to marry you, really, but a visa is not one of them. I can't do that. She stared, her eyes betraying nothing. I held my breath until she pressed my hand and said, Okay, let's start something for my house in Diani, yes? It's a nice place. I'll show you. What business did you have in mind? I sighed in relief. Well, there is something I've been looking at for a while. A, a website selling gems online. Perhaps also jewelry. All this traveling is obsolete. We buy locally and sell to a global market. On the internet? Brows furrowed in disbelief. Yes, we could do it from anywhere, even Diani. Do you really think people will buy gemstones unseen, like from a photo? I don't know. People buy shoes online now. It's coming big. Tiffany sells jewelry on the web instead of opening new shops. We stared into the passing land. A family of impalas watched the train with routine vigilance. Lizzie leaned over the table. How about good ice cream? They have none in Kenya. Nay, sorry, no. Ice cream melts. Perishable goods are very stressful, and I know nothing about food. Yes, true, I like to eat it, but 
that doesn't help much. She smiled. How about a small guest house on my land? I considered for a while, with 146K, we could probably build 10 simple cabanas in a small restaurant. A romantic idea, but I remembered my parents' guest house in Sri Lanka. It was only trouble, except during off-season, but then there was no money. You look unhappy, she said. Yes, a guest house is work 24-7. Not much fun. We had a small hotel in Sri Lanka. Drunken tourists losing their keys at 2 a.m., maids stealing. Plus, we're chained to Kenya forever. I thought, but didn't say. Instead, I offered, how about a consulting company? Something for investments in Africa. We rent a nice air-conditioned office with a view over the harbor in Mombasa, live on the beach and sell development projects. You must have contacts. Now Lizzie looked unhappy. No, no air-conditioned offices, please. That would not be much of a change for me. I like gems better. And jewelry. Later, after dessert, I asked the waiter for an old menu to write on. Reading out aloud and waiting for a nod from Lizzie after each point, I listed on the back of the paper, one. Lizzie and Ed agree to a joint venture, e-commerce with gemstones and jewelry. Two, Lizzie contributes 65K cash. Three, Ed contributes 80K in cash. Four, the business will use Lizzie's land in Diani. The land remains in Lizzie's ownership. Five, Ed contributes a basic stock valued at 110K. Those gems or their value remain in Ed's ownership. Six, profit and loss will be shared 50-50. I signed and added 2209-2001, Nairobi to Mombasa. Lizzie signed. We shook hands. Big smiles. I was happy. She, too, looked happy. I folded the menu into my pocket and said, I'll make a copy in Mombasa. This is going to be valuable memorabilia when we go public in 10 years, Lizzie said. And we laughed. Back in our compartment, I asked, Your place in Diani, is it safe? Lizzie waggled her head. Well, it is tourist country. The police go after robberies and violence. That's bad for business. Drugs and prostitution's okay, but not robbery. What about those cops who rent out their uniforms and guns at night? I think they got caught, she said. Are you sure? No. In Mombasa, we rented a battered Suzuki Samurai with no roof and no suspension. Every street bump slams straight into our spines, soon providing me with a nice headache. A piece of razor-sharp metal protruded from where the door handle must have been. The sun boiled our brains, and we breathed the unfiltered black fumes from passing trucks. It was the best car they had available. Mombasa is an island with only two bridges, both connecting to the north. The bridge to the south has been planned since 1955, but was never built, despite the fact that the main tourist area has developed in the south. Instead of a bridge, a chain of rotten ferries carry an ever-growing mass of people and vehicles to the southern mainland, across Likoni Channel. The ferries sink from time to time and are much beloved by the local shark population. Lounging safely in one of the air-conditioned tourist buses, the ferry might look adventurous and fun, but if you sit like we did, unprotected from the stabbing sun, tightly wedged between other cars and hundreds of sweating bodies, uh, the adventure soon fades, especially after the tenth crossing. To increase my discomfort, a gang of bloodshot-eyed young men took interest in Lizzie, pointing and laughing. Lizzie stared back. I feared she was going to pick a fight. They grew louder, making obscene gestures. Leave them alone. Ignore them, I hissed. Lizzie gave me one of her hard-as-nail looks and then stood up. I wanted to pull her back, but she resisted and raised her index finger at the gang, followed by a barrage of curses, roaring laughter from all sides. Public transport is boring, so the whole ferry watched on. Lizzie beckoned the ringleader, a guy with an infected eyebrow piercing, to step up and discuss matters man-to-man, but he shrunk back, blushed, muttered, and the whole gang moved away into a far corner. When Lizzie sat down, she quivered with anger. "'What did they say?' I asked as we navigated off the ferry. "'They thought you're my customer, fresh from the airport.' She honked at a cow blocking the road. "'That's the kind of crap I have to take from our own people.' We drove south on the coastal road, past resort after resort. Here and there, sunburned tourists crawled around shops and bars. An hour later, the hotel signs had thinned. Lizzie slowed, searching the jungle to the left. Somewhere here... Yes, here. 
She turned and we bounced down an unmarked dirt road. At the end of the path, I smelled the ocean. Kids ran up. We asked them to guard the car, promising a reward if all was in good order upon our return. To my surprise, they picked up stones and sticks and formed a cordon around the car, scowling into the trees. As always, Lizzie carried her Halliburton and I kept the knapsack with the gems on my back. A trail led through blazing green grass under ancient coconut trees and towards a white beach with blue water sparkling peacefully. In the distance, behind the outer reef, waves broke in white thunder. It's beautiful, I said, and Lizzie nodded proudly. Two houses stood left and right. One was shuttered closed. The other was a study in flowers and plants. As we halted, mesmerized by the scenery, screams came from inside the flower house. A baboon, swinging a pink teapot in one paw, jumped through the window and swung onto the roof. There he stopped and watched a Great Dane dashing from the house, barking, followed by an elderly European woman cursing. The monkey sneered down at them, held the teapot over his head like an Olympian, and let go a triumphal howl. The woman picked up a stone, hurled it at the monkey, but missed by a mile. The baboon sort of laughed and waved his teapot. The teapot's lid came off, rolled down the roof, and destroyed itself on the small concrete porch. As the lid splintered into a thousand pieces, the woman snarled and picked up another rock, but the monkey was gone in a flash, disappearing into the thick jungle. Only then did the Great Dane notice us and barked our way. The woman turned, flush red with anger, and seeing us, immediately broke into a long lament and rows of partially incomprehensible curses. The beast stole my teapot, my mother's teapot. What does a stupid monkey want with a teapot? Damn, if I had a shotgun, I'll get one, I swear. This was the last time. Finally, she stopped, her anger exhausted, squinting at us like a very short-sighted person, focusing on Lizzie. Lizzie raised her hand. Hey, Elizabeth, it's me, Lizzie. Still unable to see, Elizabeth came closer, slowly, until her face lit up. Ellie screamed, Lizzie! Lizzie screamed, Ellie! Ellie stormed at Lizzie, and the Great Dane stormed at me. Luckily, with only my knapsack, I had both hands free. Yet I barely managed to keep upright as the calf-sized dog slammed into my chest and licked my face. The women hugged and squeaked, kissed and squeaked again. I walked down to the small beach. Pristine white sand, shone sprinkled with shells, green coconuts, and ivory-colored driftwood. The Great Dane followed and threw itself into the sandy shadow of a palm tree, slavering happily, watching the soft waves. With the tide flowing out, the protected water between the outer reef and the beach lay calm and clear as a tropical aquarium. Colored fish zipped around corals. I dropped into the sand with a sigh. <sighs> a nice beach gets me again and again. The Great Dane got up and strolled over, pressed its huge head against my shoulders and looked at me with sagging eyes. Nice, huh? Love it too. Then I remembered why we were there, that this perhaps was my new home, headquarters of our future e-commerce company. I looked back to the empty house. One living room with two or three bedrooms. Square, practical, but as all things unused here and exposed to the sea, in bad shape, needing not only a paint but serious repairs. This was going to cost money. Money! Worries swamped my brain and the beautiful beach disappeared. My headache returned and the knapsack suddenly felt heavier. A buzz from my cell phone disturbed my worries. No caller ID. I, I took it anyways. Ed? Ed? Peter here, still alive. Peter, are you in... I couldn't say it. Yes, my jet is grounded. I... Static on the line. Four seasons. Just wanted to... More static. Talk later. So glad you're okay, I yelled, but I wasn't sure he heard. The line was dead. I went back to Lizzie and Elizabeth. They stood waiting for me and the Great Dane following behind. Edward, this is Elizabeth, Lizzie said. She's a friend of my father's cousin. She's been taking care of my land here. Elizabeth stretched out her thin but strong hand. Ellie is fine. Welcome to Diani, Edward. Ed is fine, I said. Nice beach you have here. Ellie placed us on the terrace for a tea. In lack of a pot, she used a water pitcher. 
She was a pleasant person, around 50, natural, a bit eccentric perhaps, but like most expats in such places, she didn't seem to be a lunatic or a crazy alcoholic or such. She laughed a lot. The only serious topic, no laughs there, were the monkeys. She was obsessed with those wicked devils, as she called them. Not the usual black-faced velvet monkey, but real big baboons with big teeth and strong arms. They had appeared a few months ago, terrorizing the area, stealing anything and everything. A restaurant manager had shot one and hung him in the tree half-dead. A success, sort of. The monkeys didn't go there anymore, but neither did the tourists. The Great Dane, she was a girl, followed me like a duckling and laid her head in my lap as soon as I sat down. I liked her, too, even with the wet slobber she disposed on my trousers. "'Why don't you scare the monkeys?' I asked the dog and patted her on the head, producing a hollow sound. "'Never! They sneak up on her when she sleeps and pull her by the ears, those wicked beasts,' Ellie said, and then disappeared into a hysterical fit of laughter." This was Ellie's one annoying habit. She laughed long and loud, mostly about her own jokes, shrieking and slamming her thighs even for only remotely funny remarks, completely oblivious of her surroundings. During the first hour, we joined in, being polite, laughing with her, but it got very tiring. She didn't seem to mind, however. At times, she alone neighed and snorted while everybody else sat uncomfortably quiet, waiting for her to stop laughing so we could get back to our conversation. I pulled the dog's head up, needing both hands to move the giant skull, looked in her sagging eyes and said, "'You have big teeth. They're just monkeys.' She looked at me with a tender expression, tail wagging and slobber dropping. Brunhilda has no clue what teeth are for, Elizabeth laughed some more. She scares the living hell out of the blacks, but not the monkeys. They know she's harmless. Brunhilda? I turned to Ellie. You're a Wagner fan? Ellie nodded and pointed to a stack of vinyl records in the corner. The last connection to my own culture. But now I'll need a locked cupboard because of these damned... She stopped herself and said, enough of my world-shattering monkey problems. Now tell me, what are you two doing here? I looked at Lizzie, not sure if we were ready to talk about it. But Lizzie was ready. We're starting a business. Lizzie cast a happy side glance at me. Together. How romantic. Where? Ellie clapped her hands. Here, Lizzie said, matter of fact. Here? Ellie scowled in disbelief. Da, this country is, well, you know it. She looked at Lizzie, then at me. It's not easy. You've studied economics and all. What business can you do in Kenya? Lizzie giggled. (laughs) Not only here in Kenya. I meant here, here. Lizzie waved at the other house. Ellie stared, baffled, and then screamed, Really? Here? That would be wonderful. The women jumped up and hugged. Brunhilde barked over the table, The teacups fluttered. Later in the afternoon, we were driving down the coast road again. Lizzie said, Brunhilde really liked you, huh? You have a way with women. We'll need a fierce guard dog if we start business there, I said. Yeah, with those wicked monkeys, she smiled. How's Peter? Stuck in his hotel, I guess. Can you imagine if a guy like Peter can't get away what chaos there must be? Beyond my imagination, she shook her head. Are you positive this is a good time to start a business? Absolutely. Or would you prefer to submit job applications? Nothing will happen unless we do it ourselves. Lizzie didn't answer, just stared ahead. After a while, she said, You know, we could also lay low here in Diani with the cash we have. Easy living for a year or two. Later, we could see what to do. Sit on the beach for a year? No, I I get seriously bored. No good. Let's have a holiday, and then we start working. Yeah, you're right. I know a nice resort in the hills. She touched my knee. Let's go there. Chapter 3 We spent two wonderfully relaxing weeks in a colonial-style all-wood safari hotel built into the steep rainforest, watching tropical birds, dingy dinghies, and snakes from small and colorful to gray and thick, all the while having tea on wooden porches and dinners at open fireplaces. Very romantic. Every third day, 
Less romantic, we made a cash tour to Diani, visiting all local banks and taking $500 each from our credit cards, debits, and Lizzie's Nairobi account. We could have drawn more in one go, but it was better not to attract attention beyond the normal tourist business. Each tour, we gathered around $10,000, or rather a small plastic bag filled with wads of 200 and 500 Kenya shilling notes. After two weeks, colonial-style tea on wooden porches and dinners at open fireplaces became repetitious, and I knew every snake and bird by name. More importantly, we had $105,000 in cash, five bank tours plus the savings from Jacket. In fact, a huge overseas suitcase bursting with Kenya shillings. On our last day in the reserve, Peter called us from a London landline. He finally had gotten clearance to fly out of New York and was working through the messy post-9-11 business. We're going on a buying tour into Savo. Can I bring you something special, I asked? Yes, but only very special. I figured. Anything in particular? Well, green grossurolite, obviously. Other rare garnets for me and my daughter only. Not for business. Just for my little museum. Call me if you're not sure. Mm, budget? Unlimited. That's enough, I laughed. <laughs> I'll keep an eye out for something special. Zomo, Lizzie's uncle and Voy, was instructed to organize a so-called Buyer's Week. He spread word that a professional buyer was going to be in his office every day from 0900 to 1800, ready for business, cash in hand. He rented security guards and paid the local police to hang around and help in case of trouble. Meanwhile, we moved to the Salt Lick Game Lodge in the Savo West National Safari Park. There, we pretended to be a simple couple amongst dozens of other tourists, a great cover and very secure. Early morning on the second day, we left the hotel telling everybody who listened that we were going to hike in the park and that we'd be back late. We drove the Suzuki to a wooden garage in the middle of the park, a place run by the Maasai, intended for tourists to hire a guide and see lions on foot. To the Maasai's surprise, we declined the offered guide. Lion will eat your muzungu they told Lizzie, and laughed. We waited in our car until a gray-green Land Rover appeared. Lizzie greeted Zomo, the uncle from Voy, a good-humored man without a single hair, assumingly a genetic defect. We exited the garage in Zomo's Land Rover, thus breaking the connection between the tourists from the Salt Lick and the gym buyers in Voy. When we arrived at Zomo's home, a prosperous villa by local standards, more than a hundred men, no women, filled the inner courtyard. Everybody jumped up and pressed forward. We came to a halt in a sea of bodies waving bags and boxes with gemstones, holding up crystals and rocks. My skin tingled with a hunter's anticipation. For a change, Lizzie looked scared. These are all just miners, traders. Don't worry, it's always like that, I said. This looks like a riot, Lizzie whispered. Zomo honked, inching his car on, the security guards threatening the crowd with sticks, and slowly we made it to the entrance. There, we ducked from the car straight into the main house like movie stars chased by paparazzi. People jostled for position, but nobody was allowed in, yet. In the office, I sat behind a big wooden table, Lizzie by my side, Zomo and his accountant behind. Zomo was going to get 5% off every deal, payable by the seller. When all was ready... The tea hot, the pens working, money secured in locked drawers, dishes filled with water to wash rough, torches loaded, tweezers, lenses, pocket calculator, bags and boxes at hand. Zomo opened the door. The first seller was a miner with hands like shovels, including the dirt. He smiled with a row of immaculate white teeth and emptied a bag of rough sovereite onto the table. I picked up the first stone, cleaned it in water, and shone a strong light through the gem to detect inclusions or cracks. One by one, I sorted through the pebbles, dividing them into desirables and duds. I explained every decision to Lizzie, showed her good colors, clean pieces, nasty inclusions. She nodded bravely, though I was sure she could only understand half of what I said. The miner sat across the table, smiling, patiently watching my every move, every facial expression, as we discussed his gems. After half an hour, I declared fifteen of his rough as undesirable and pushed them back towards the miner. The remaining ten pieces I pulled closer to our side. Amongst these ten good pieces, there was an exceptional three-gram rough with a glass-like body and an electric glimmer inside. It would cut to perhaps five carats, a considerable size in Savo rights. I pulled the good ten closer to my side of the table. 
those I might take. How much? Take all, said the man, pushing the bad fifteen a few inches into my direction and sweeping his hand over the two piles. Understandably, he wanted me to buy all, not only his best, but I'd end up with a set of cheap cabochons. No, only these ten, please. How much? I asked again and pushed his fifteen an inch back. He frowned, examining the good tin, holding each stone against the light, and dang, selected the three gram rough which I wanted most and moved it a few inches to the side, still within my reach but separated from the other nine. He knew his business. Now we had three separated items to negotiate. He smiled his big white smile and pointed at the nine. Six hundred for those. How much for all? I motioned for all twenty-five. His face lit up. Two thousand for all. I threw up my arms. Impossible! I can't! Pure show. He picked up my favorite, held it up, and proudly said, This alone is one thousand. Take the whole table for two thousand. I can take all for fifteen hundred. Half are no good. He groaned in despair, pulling his hair. Show! This first deal of the week was most important. I had to balance my negotiation carefully. Not too soft, but not too hard either. This man was going to give the first news to those waiting outside. If the others thought me a soft-skinned muzungu with too much money to burn, we'd be having a hard time with every deal and end up paying too much all week long. If, on the other hand, he would tell them that I was a tight-ass buyer without mercy, those sellers with good stones would leave rather than wait outside for days only to get ripped off. The longer a seller waits, the more desperate his cash situation gets. After all, he cannot work and his family has to eat. Lizzie followed the tedious negotiation with big round eyes. Though it was half her money, she didn't ask for voting rights. After much back and forth, I bought the good pile of Savorites, including my favorite, for seventeen fifty. The miner paid Zomo 5% commission, and we parted in good standing. He promised to come back with rubies. I hoped he was going to give me a thumbs up when he stepped into the waiting crowd outside. The rough gems we sent to the uncle's lapidary for immediate cutting. Lizzie sighed, exhausted, obviously expecting a rest. But the next seller, actually a crew of three dealers, rushed through the door before she could intervene. The three co-owned a big but badly cut ruby. I explained to Lizzie the ways of ruby, its hues, the cutting, and a million other things. Thus, another round of grim negotiation began. Again and again, the three got into fiery arguments amongst themselves and had to step outside. Yet they could never agree. This went on until the uncle told them to get their act together now or come back another day, which in our language meant, don't come back. Zomo's threat worked, and I bought the 10-carat egg-shaped ruby for 2200 Yes, those were the days. As I write in 2014, this stone would have cost $25,000 if you were quick and lucky. Except for a brief sandwich at noon, we haggled, bluffed, poker-faced, and counted money non-stop for nine hours. At six in the evening, I looked out the shuttered windows. Even more people than in the morning stood waiting there. I took Lizzie's hand. Can you do more? No, no, I'm totally brain dead, moaned Lizzie, her eyes blunt and starry. I want to go, please. The uncle went out to call it a day. In Zomo's car, Lizzie said, I see rotating gems when I close my eyes. Normal, that's the job. It'll get better, later. I hope so. I can't close my eyes or I'll be sick. We got out our car from the Maasai's garage and drove through the pitch-dark park, always aiming at the only light on the horizon, our hotel. Since we had told the manager that we would be late, they hadn't yet called in the rescue squad. An all-you-can-eat buffet was open until 2200, and we arrived at 2145. The remains didn't look appetizing, but no refills were to be expected. Careful what you eat, I whispered to Lizzie. This is a never-come-back hotel. A uh, what? A standing joke amongst hotel managers. Can poison the guests, they never come back anyway. We avoided shellfish and skipped the meatball masala. Next day at breakfast, Lizzie complained that she had dreamed of gems. We drove to the garage, changed into Zomo's Land Rover, and another day began, intense, arduous, and yet exhilarating, at least for me. And then another day. On the third day, the fourth seller, a tall Maasai in bright colors and with giant earlobes, offered a box of assorted so-so roughs, nothing special. 
While I examined his stones, the Maasai pulled a fist-sized hexagonal crystal in a reddish mauve color from his dress and, closely watching my reaction, rolled it on the table. I briefly glanced at the giant crystal. Nerve ends sizzled, and I longed to touch the stone, but I ignored the impulse, forcing myself to continue with the other roughs in due order. Any extra attention would double the crystal's price. Lizzie, however, pursed her lips, took up the crystal, studied it, and asked something I can't remember. Perhaps for the first time, I ignored Lizzie's question. The Maasai immediately caught the irregularity and smiled knowingly. I had made a mistake, but it was too late. Cursing inwards, I worked through the rest of the box. Lizzie put the rock back on the table and shrugged. After selecting a few roughs for negotiation, I took up the big crystal. The sizzling in my brain returned with fresh intensity. The stone looked and felt like a spinel, but strangely, something was amiss. Or, more precisely, something was too much. It didn't belong there. My blood pressure went up. I glanced at the cellar. He was a proud warrior in the prime of life, fighting scars on his face, and surely able to detect the accelerating heartbeat of an opponent. The crystal was exceptionally clean, with only some growth lines and a few inclusions. I switched my balance from carat to gram and leisurely threw the crystal on it. 133 grams. A quarter pound! A remarkable size that would cut into over 100 carat. A 100 carat spinel was an exciting find. However, my hands didn't shake because of the size, but because this was not a spinel. I clearly saw light and shadow splitting inside the stone. Spinel doesn't double refract. I turned the crystal this way and that, shone light in it, scratched its surface, and waited again. Then, as if by chance, I laid it onto a paper filled with scribbled numbers. I tried not to stare, but there it was. The crystal reproduced the numbers beneath, clearly doubling and mirroring them. This stone was double refractive. Spinel, however, is single refractive. In a smaller gem, I might not have noticed, but this giant's double refraction was visible to the naked eye without further testing. If this was true, I was looking at one of the rarest gems in the world. A Tophite. And what a Tophite! Giant, clean, and not badly colored. Something special, Peter. Here was serious business. My throat dry, I dared not take up the tea for fear of spilling. A world record gem. Patience. Casually, I laid the Tophite with the other rough and thus formally opened negotiation over the complete lot. But the Maasai, again with his knowing smile, pushed the crystal to the side, singling it out. So the Maasai knew that I knew that he knew the crystal was special. However, I was sure he thought it only especially big, nothing else. He didn't know what was spinel or sapphire or garnet, much less could he ID a toffite. We negotiated a bit for the box of small roughs, just fishing around, pretending not to be concerned with the giant rock on the table, though it screamed for attention. After a while, I again picked up the crystal and held it like a hand axe. Big enough to kill a lion, <laughs> I said, laughing alone, like Ellie. Everybody else frowned. Especially the Maasai did not appreciate the reference and scowled frightfully. I felt like a bumbling tourist and muttered some excuse. The uncle helped with a few soothing words in Swahili and the tension subsided. Uh, how much then? asked the bumbling tourist. Ten thousand, said the Maasai with a grim smile. The uncle laughed politely. Lizzie smacked her lips. Even for a 133-gram spinel, this was an unusual ask. More money than a whole Maasai tribe might earn in a year. I would have expected a few thousand. My lion joke, it seemed, had blown up the price. I steadied my hands and poured fresh tea, winning some time to consider. Seriously, big gems are rare, but often hard to sell because they evade the jewelry market. Who wants to have a quarter pound of rock around his neck, even if it is a sapphire? Often such stones are broken up into smaller pieces and sold separately. However, if this was in fact a Tophite, and I was 95% positive, then the laws of physics or jewelry did not apply. A world record gem gets international press, is sought after by the museums, and will be an honor for the owner, for Peter.
but I had to have his backup for such a price. I pretended to receive a call on my mobile and walked off into a side room. There I called London and was lucky to get Peter on the line. I have a big taw fight. Very big. You interested? Sure am, he said without hesitation. Can you wire 50k to Kenya? 50? That big? Over 100 carat after cutting. Awed silence in London. It sells as Spinel, I added. Deal, Peter said. I'll text you my bank data in a minute. I need cash today. You got it. My banker is fast. That done, I went back into the office, sat down, savored the moment, pointed at the big crystal, and said, 10,000 is okay. The uncle and his accountant gasped. Lizzie stared, mouth open. The Maasai looked first puzzled, then happy, until doubt crossed his face, and he slapped his forehead, finally cursing loudly. I had accepted his price without negotiation. That could mean only one thing. He had asked under value. He moaned, fidgeted on his stool, looking for a way out, a chance to modify the deal. Honor forbade him to pull back or raise his price. Also, 10 k after all was a fortune here. He definitely wanted the money. He wouldn't refuse and run home, but he desperately wanted to squeeze some extra out of us without losing face. He glanced around the room, searching for help, but everybody stood firmly on our side, ready to enforce the unwritten rules of the trade. Then his eyes flickered. He pushed the crystal back to the other rough, all onto one heap, thus formally reopening the negotiation. Not exactly a kosher move, but understandable. Can please make a new offer for all? He begged with his best smile. At that moment, dramatically, the power supply broke, leaving us in the dark. Before the generator kicked in, the lights flickered on again. The Maasai's smile had frozen. I dragged the tension just a bit longer, looked at Lizzie, nodded towards the uncle, and then slammed a hand on the table. Twenty thousand for all. The Maasai's mouth opened and closed in disbelief. Then he whooped and jumped across the table to hug me with his intense, distinguishable African body odor. I fought him off, laughing. <laughs> but I need a promise, I said. Anything, my honor, he said. Don't tell that I buy Spinel at such prices, I mean. This is only between us. Promised? Promised, sir. Promised. And he hugged me again. I hope you know what you're doing, Lizzie whispered. I nodded bravely. While I counted a big stash of bills, the Maasai pledged his ancestors and his tribe's honor on total discretion, guaranteed the health of my grandkids, again and again kissed the totem hanging around his neck, pulled a few more ruffs from his dress and lay them with the others. For free, for you, he beamed. Peter sent the 50K on the same day, pocket change for him, I imagined. Lizzie made two more bank runs to get cash while I continued to splurge on gems from morning to evening, day in, day out. I immediately reinvested the so far only assumed profit from the Tophite and extended the buyer's week into 10 days. Once in hunting mode, with dozens of sellers lingering in the uncle's courtyard, I, like a compulsive gambler, couldn't stop buying until the money was gone. Contrary to the always unfortunate gambler, however, the gem dealer keeps the loot, and if he's a good buyer, he'll make a profit and go on new binges. Thus, the circle closes into a lifetime of high-intensity buying, followed by near-death experiences with empty bank accounts and bare survival, until enough sales justify the next buying trip. A cautious gym buyer, perhaps an oxymoron, might have stacked away Peter's money for a rainy day, but then a cautious person may never become a successful gym dealer. When we had only 6000 in cash left, Lizzie began pestering me to stop. Down to 5000 I finally tore myself away. We had bought a fine selection of gemstones, from the odd yellow citrine to venomous green sovereite to steel blue and green sapphire, from stones retailing for a mere hundred dollars to very expensive rarities. Chapter 4 Over our last dinner at the Salt Lick, Lizzie asked, So how are we selling all those gems? We dig in at Elizabeth's and build a website, I said, with all the optimism I could muster. Next day, we carefully packed our loot from Voy and my old stock into Lizzie's Halliburton. Filled with gemstones, it weighed several pounds. Then we sat in silent awe, staring at the sum of our possessions. 
We must guard this case under all circumstances. It never leaves my hand, I said. Well, why don't we cuff you to it? Lizzie chuckled. No, that draws too much attention. I pulled my Japanese knife out, a one-hander of finest samurai steel from the inside of my sleeve, and said, This must help, if necessary. Lizzie looked unhappy. Hey, don't worry, I never used it, but I would like to make your case look a bit more used and older. Can I put some tapes and sticker stuff on it, I asked. Now Lizzie looked even unhappier. It's a present from my father, she protested. Why don't we take your knapsack? That's just fabric. This here is bulletproof and fire resistant. I always wanted one. Lizzie shrugged, reluctantly agreeing to disfigure her perfect golden Halliburton. I'm sure your father would approve, I said. I stuck two I Love Kenya stickers and a Salt Lake Game Lodge logo, a giraffe from the souvenir shop on the sides, glued an unused Dubai security label onto the top, and added some numbers and names with a permanent marker. Lizzie sighed deeply. Look, this is our life here inside, I said, and she nodded grudgingly. We checked out from the lodge and drove back to Diani in one day. Brunhilde ran in wild circles, barking and spraying slaver. They took my toilet brush, Ellie said as soon as Brunhilde had calmed down. What? Lizzie and I asked in unison. The monkeys, they stole my toilet brush. Over the next few days, Lizzie and Ellie took care of our new residence. They aired it thoroughly, deep cleaned and disinfected it, expelled all unwanted inhabitants, rats, bats, wasps, ants, and collected mostly secondhand furniture from neighbors and local shops. Meanwhile, I spent the days in a filthy internet cafe, educating myself about the basics of e-commerce. I registered a company in Singapore, including bank account and tax number, all online. In the evenings, we sat on Ellie's veranda, griping about our daily problems, how, in addition to the frequent power cuts, my internet connection crashed without obvious reasons, how it was impossible to procure anything valuable without driving two hours back and forth to Mombasa, and how we needed to focus on items that no monkey could carry off. Ellie employed an elderly live-in housemaid, Rosalind, who was practically part of the family, and now also helped us. I swore Rosalind to unlimited secrecy about all our doings. We developed an official story for public distribution. Edward, the fiction writer, no, not a famous one, and Lizzie, his fiancée from Nairobi, were taking a long-term holiday for Lizzie to relax and for Edward to work on his latest novel. No business was conducted from our house ever. This I told the people at the Internet Cafe and anybody else who asked or would listen. If word got out that we traded in gems, we were all bushmeat. I hoped that nobody from Voy would discover us in Diani. In the mornings, Brunhilde and I explored the always changing scenery of the coral reef. At low tide, we jumped from island to island as far as the outer reef and to the drop off. From there, I saw dolphins and tunas hunting for prey, birds circling over the foaming water. Just beyond the reef lay a sudden 500 meter descent into the blue ocean. As a fearless boy, I had fished there in local dugouts or in a little rubber dinghy with giant turtles, sharks, and dorados passing at arm's length and fly fish sailing overhead. It was every bit as dangerous as it sounds, and now as a responsible adult, I wouldn't dare do it again. <laughs> but what an adventure it had been those days. One morning, Brunhilde disappeared through the thickets above the beach and began to bark in alarm mode. I followed slowly and carefully, because these thickets contain all kinds of suckers and biters, but shrill squeals of another animal made me hurry. Anxious that Brunhilde, in her naivete, got herself into trouble, I called her back, but she didn't come, nor would she stop barking. When I found the dog, she stood over a yellowish-brown lump lying on the jungle floor. I stepped up again, carefully. It looked like a monkey, like a baboon. Had Brunhilde finally cornered one of the wicked monkeys? Yes, she had. Only this one was dead. Or was it? Something moved. I, I stepped closer, now even more careful. Baboons feature leopard-style fangs and are stronger than any wrestler. You don't want to get into any arguments with them, especially not with a wounded one. But this monkey lay still, sprawled on the floor, face down. It was dead. Yet something moved. Then I saw it. 
a baby monkey with thin, long hair, except on the face, and absurdly big ears like a bat's, now folded around the head in deadly fear, clung deep in the big animal's fur. I waited, watching. The adult monkey, I assumed it was the mother, didn't move nor breathe, not that I could see. Heart pumping, I stubbed her with my foot. The baby screeched, but the mother didn't budge. Stiff, utterly dead. This was strange. I was no baboon expert, but it struck me as odd that she was lying here alone without her troop, but with the baby. Sick, she would have stayed with her rot, and they would not have left her alone. If she had died with the rot, however, and they had moved on, the baby would have been taken over by another mother. I looked into the trees. All quiet. No monkeys. They would have started a full-blown riot long ago, sending Brunhilde and me bolting for our lives. No, that monkey had died alone, with the baby on her back. Very strange. Finally, Brunhilde stopped barking, exhausted. The little monkey changed from squeaking to whimpering. From time to time, he looked at us, hid his face in the mother's fur, terrified, and then looked back at us and again hid his face. I was sure he would bite me if I tried to grab him. I didn't know then that baby monkeys have no teeth, but I wasn't about to experiment. Yet, if I left him alone, he'd be eaten. Baby monkey is tasty. Cats, dogs, snakes would love him. And also, some locals may have a barbecue feast. I checked myself for coverage and battery. Full. I praised technology's conquest of the wild and dialed Lizzie. Listen, keep quiet. Is Ellie around? I asked. Um, uh, yes. As expected, they were having breakfast. Do not react. Don't tell her now. I found a baby monkey. Silence then. That's probably not a good idea. Yes, I know, but the fellow was really small, a few weeks old, big brown eyes and so. I can't leave him here. He'll be eaten. Again, silence. In the back, I heard Ellie asking, What's up? Perhaps he can be useful, I added quickly, to keep away the wild ones. <sighs> I don't know, Lizzie sighed. But it's your house, right? Yes, but... I interrupted. Da, my battery goes. Sorry, I'm coming. When she sees him, she'll agree. I didn't wait for an answer, but hung up and pulled off my shirt. The little fellow fought bravely against my shirt, screaming and scratching, but I bagged him without mutual harm. He was tiny, scarcely as long as my hand. His skin felt scrappy, skinny to the bone. Once he was locked in the dark, he stopped screaming and kept still, except for a little shiver. I pulled the mother by the shoulder, trying to roll her around, but she was stiff and heavy and didn't move. I set the shirt with the baby on the floor and used both hands. She turned with a sudden thud and I stumbled backwards. Her skull was deformed, broken, I suppose. The teeth lay bared, but the body looked unhurt. At least I couldn't see any wounds from bullets or such. Do monkeys fall from trees? A strangely familiar smell rose from the corpse. I sniffed. Booze? This monkey smelled of alcohol. A drunken monkey? Falling from the tree? Perhaps she was one of the stealing band, had grabbed a bottle of liquor, and it had killed her. That would make sense, or it, at least be an explanation. I left the dead mother behind and marched the shivering monkey back to our house. From time to time, Brunhilde shoved the bundle with her nose, and the little monkey gave an indignant shack attack. When I came home, the two women, Rosalind and the gardener, were already waiting. Lizzie must have told them something was happening. I held up the bundle and called, Surprise! Ellie scowled. What is it? A monkey, I said, as cheerful as possible. Ellie's face snapped in disgust and she stepped back. Quickly, I added, a tiny baby monkey. Ellie's grimace softened only slightly. Is he injured? Lizzie asked, her hand on Ellie's arm. I hope not, I said, carefully laying the shivering bundle on the big veranda table. Shack attack, said the bundle. Ellie muttered something that included, damn monkey. I unknotted the shirt and the little fellow spilled onto the table. The women and the servants squeaked in various tones. Brunhilde barked. The monkey screamed in terror and tried to run. It was just a teeny weeny baby. Later, I estimated he might have been only three or four days old when I found him. A few weeks later, he would have bolted into the jungle and be gone forever. But then he was all fragile, barely able to coordinate his movements, like a human toddler. He tumbled left and right in awkward jerks, glanced around with many shack attacks, fell on his belly, got up again, trying to escape from the unspeakable monster staring, shouting, and howling at him. With the back of my hand, I prevented him from falling off the table. Slowly, he calmed down, or rather gave up, 
came to a halt, exhausted, whimpering in an upright fetal position. I held out my hand, palm up. He stared, but didn't move. Careful, they bite, said Ellie, mouth pulled downwards. I don't think he has teeth, I said, and that seemed to touch Ellie. Lizzie and Rosalind cooed in mother mode. I tried to pick him up, but he shied away. I tried again. Finally, after a long, hard look and with something like a sigh, he allowed me to push him onto my hand, lift him from the table, and cradle him in my arm. Lizzie nudged herself in. Slowly, I transferred him into her arm. Across species, the monkey sensed Lizzie's maternal qualities and didn't fight back. Soon, he was comfortably nestling against Lizzie's breasts. Even Ellie couldn't suppress a smile when the little fellow made a content mewing sound under Lizzie's caresses. Rosalind begged to hold him, but Lizzie didn't want to share. I turned to Ellie. He might be helpful with the wild monkeys. Ellie wasn't convinced. No, he'll pee and poop all over the house, break stuff, and when he's old enough, he'll run away to his wild friends, and we'll be happy he's gone. That's how it works. Perhaps we can train him, like a watchdog or, or geese, I said. Ellie shook her head in disbelief. Young man, it's obvious that you have no experience with wildlife in Africa. I shrugged. However, babies deserve protection. Nobody could abandon such a cute ball of helplessness. We fed him mashed bananas and later minced beef. He ate greedily with shifty eyes scrutinizing the perimeter as if afraid somebody was going to steal his food. A few days later, I noticed a local walking up and down the beach calling for his dog. I thought that odd because the locals usually get no closer to dogs than a stone's throw. Perhaps he was searching for his employer's lost dog. I have a soft spot for lost dogs and sent the gardener to inquire. When the gardener came back, he shrugged, he won't tell. He's drunk. Not from here. He pulled a disgusted face. A Kikuyu. The Kikuyu are the major tribe living up country. The gardener was a Luo. He wouldn't sit at the same table with a Kikuyu unless forced to. Lizzie, too, was a Kikuyu, but she was beyond tribal rivalry, more a Westerner in the eyes of the gardener, especially since she was part of the salary-paying class. Chapter 5 Monkeys develop like humans, just a lot faster. Within two weeks, the little fellow had doubled his weight and quadrupled his courage. He coaxed Brunhilde to be his bodyguard and explored every corner of our property. With reference to his bodyguard, we named him Valkura, though he was a boy. After Brunhilde rescued him from drowning in the toilet bowl, the two became an inseparable team and Brunhilde discovered her equine qualities. The monkey rode on Brunhilde, gripping her long ears like reins and screaming with joy while the dog galloped at full speed over the beach. Baby monkey rides Great Dane. A decade later, they would have gone viral on YouTube, but those days I didn't even take a photo. Lizzie did, but those images were lost later. Remarkably, we didn't have any more visits from the stealing monkeys. Ellie admitted that Valkura had a positive effect. Perhaps, we mused, other monkeys feared that where there was a baby, there must be a mother. And mothers are dangerous, so they stayed away. Meanwhile, I managed to publish a basic website and struggle with the intricacies of photographing our precious items, a task that turned out to be difficult beyond imagination. In our house, we used one bedroom as an office and kept its window shuttered and its door locked, always. Rosalind had strict orders not to enter the room. We kept both keys on our bodies at all times. Inside the office, we chained the Halliburton to a concrete pillar, sitting inside a locked steel cupboard, which Lizzie had made to order for that purpose. To the chain, I added an electric circuit, which, if forced open, would give an ear-splitting alarm signal. It took five minutes to get a stone from the case and back, but I was disciplined, always locking and chaining the case safely. As you can imagine, I didn't want to see a monkey carrying off our Halliburton. The little internet shop was a terrible place to work from. Nothing functioned for longer than an hour, and the owner became nosier by the day. Sometimes he sneaked up from behind to see what I was doing. I told him to bugger off, but he got me paranoid. Finally, I ordered the landline in Ellie's house to be connected to the web and bought a wireless router to extend the signal to the other house. Looking back, this sounds simple, but in 2001, it was cutting-edge technology, in Africa no less. Helping little Valkura jumped the technician from Safari Telecom and successfully rode him from the grounds with Brunhilde racing behind, barking. Oh, the poor guy must have thought his last day had come. 
For weeks, Safari Telecom had nobody to fill his place. I explained to Valcura that writing a technician from the telecom was not part of his responsibilities. He shack attackered excitedly, but I didn't think he understood. By then, Valcura had become a natural force, willful, cunning, and fast. Soon he would be beyond our control, untamable in his strength and ferocity. See, Ellie said. We tried to restrain Valcura with a collar and a leash, but he behaved like Gollum on the elves' rope until we gave it up. Finally, I had a cage made for Valcura. At night, or when we expected visitors, Valcura had to go into his cage. Luckily, he was totally corrupt for sweets. For a candy, he'd do anything, go anywhere, even into the cage. There he sat happily sucking his lollipop. As soon as the candy was done and he realized we had locked him in again, he threw a choleric fit. However, the trick worked every time. He didn't have much long-term memory or his lust for candy was simply uncontrollable. I tried working from our new office, but soon realized I needed air conditioning or the computer would drown in sweat. Another $500 from our ever-tighter funds went into a new AC. Soon, we dropped under 2 k in cash reserves. With no income in sight, such an emptying wallet is as scary as a hungry T-Rex. I called my friend, the DJ in Berlin, and broke the bad news that I could no longer pay my share of the rent. He cursed, but in the end accepted realities. I hoped he wouldn't sell my furniture, which he might have considered his right, and I would have understood. During such times, even the most determined entrepreneur longs for a 9-to-5 job with pension fund and health care. A heavy weight lay on my shoulders, and life felt like tacking against a gale. Lizzie suggested to ask Peter for help. I procrastinated, but finally my pride gave way, and I called London. One ore stock had fallen 20% after the PR debacle on Madagascar, and another 36% since 9-11. But then everybody had suffered, and Peter sounded all right. He appeared to belong to an exceptional breed, a wealthy person who didn't care whether he was estimated at 10 or at 5 billion. What are you doing? You still with Lizzie, he asked. Yep. <laughs> she got you by the ears, he laughed loud and long, the laugh all free men have for those in bondage. Very funny. I waited until he was finished. Yeah, probably you're right, but I'm happy. Where is that happiness? South of Mombasa. Busy? Hell yes. I don't run a Fortune 500 company, but I'm busy. Very busy. Another month or so, and I need positive cash flow. Silence. I feared the connection was gone, and then he was back, and I breathed again. You know, he said, I have a trip to Tanzania planned. I could stop by in Mombasa. I breathed even deeper as he continued. I could get that big fight and see what you're doing. You still have my fight, don't you? A bit of edge in his voice. Sure, all yours and my safe. I didn't feel the necessity to tell him that our safe was a briefcase chained inside a cupboard. So I'll come and we'll have a chat, he asked merrily. Any time. Lizzie will be happy too. We have a baby monkey riding on a Great Dane you must see. Sounds fun. I'll get my guys to work out the details. Your guys? Uh, just one thing, I hesitated. How to say this politely. Uh, we're here, uh, very low-key. Nobody knows what we do. So, I mean, you won't come with three cars and bodyguards, would you? <laughs> Why, you don't have a helipad? Laughing again. No worries, I can do low-key for a while. I'll stay in a hotel near to you. Can you get me from there? You do have a car, Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure you'd consider it a car, but it drives, yes. We had taken the Suzuki Samurai as a long-term rental and privately shelled out $500 for a new suspension and a door handle. Lately, the motor had begun to make weird sounds, but it was still moving fine. After I hung up, the weight on my shoulder shifted into a more comfortable position, and I rushed to tell Lizzie. She looked relieved as well. So far, she hadn't complained about my business progress, but I knew that she, too, was counting towards a red zero. Then, next day, bingo! I made a sale, online! A small sapphire sold for $180 to a lady in Florida. I would have kissed her feet if I would have had a chance. We celebrated loud and long, a historical moment. We had proof it was possible to sell loose gems over the web. We might have been one of the first to do so. One little sale, but where there was one, there would be others. We had produced positive cash flow, if only for a moment. The founding event of a new trade, perhaps. I was so proud. 
Today, this seems trivial, but remember in 2001, Amazon was only a startup that had survived the dot-com bust. The cold shower followed soon when I tried to ship the gemstone to Florida. FedEx? We don't ship valuables. UPS? You need an export license from the government. Kenyan Post? I need to ask the postmaster, uh, but he's on sick leave since last year. After a harrowing day in Mombasa, I returned to Diani, the sapphire still in my bag, frustrated and with a headache. The Suzuki's empty petrol tank had turned our cash flow negative again. In a fog of nausea, I considered that perhaps the world was not yet ready for international retail. I emailed our first customer that we had to work out a little detail, but would ship soon. Fortunately, the lady was very kind and in no hurry. Luckily, gems don't spoil. Lizzie was so deeply worried that she had herself a rash of herpes. Then, early next day, another order came in. A Savarite for $255. More headache. By now, I was hoping not to get new orders. In the end, we did what everybody did those days. We posted neutral envelopes declared as sample. Even today, most developing countries are cut off from legal e-commerce by rules developed in the 19th century for Walmart and BP. But don't get me started. More fun. Valcura and Brunhilde had gathered a fan club. Every morning, tourists from the surrounding resorts assembled on our beach and waited for Monkey riding the Great Dane down the beach. Sometimes Valcura lost his balance and then hung from one of Brunhilde's ears or rode underbelly. Whatever they did, it was spectacularly funny. The crowd roared with laughter, spurring the two animals to ever wilder acrobatics. Dog and Monkey obviously enjoyed the attention and came up with new tricks on a daily basis. The gardener wanted to collect money from the Muzungus for watching the rodeo, but we stopped him. Again, I noted the Kikuyu glaring at us from behind the tourists, and I didn't like it. When I went to confront him, he turned and ran away. Two nights later, Valcura vanished. Lizzie, who had locked him into his cage the prior evening, swore that she had closed the latch. Either the monkey had figured out how to open the cage, or somebody had let him out. In any case, we were deeply disappointed. We hadn't expected Valcura to simply run away. After all, we were his rot, his family, breakfast, candy, and all. See, said Ellie. Especially Brunhilde was heartbroken. Great Danes are very sensitive dogs. She kept watch at Valcura's empty cage day and night. Wouldn't go for a walk, even refused to eat. Seeing that dog suffer was the worst. I shared the bad news with the waiting tourists and asked them to look out for the lost monkey. We hoped that he would return when hunger or loneliness caught up with him, but in vain we listened for his shack attack. Chapter 6 One Sunday morning, Peter arrived in Mombasa and checked into the Diani Reef Hotel. Lizzie and I went to pick him up. I hope he likes the Tafite, I said on the way. Oh, I hadn't thought about it anymore. Lizzie looked at me with big spooked eyes. But, I, I mean, could he, like, refuse it? Theoretically, yes, he could. Lizzie stared ahead. I sure hope he likes it. Peter had aged visibly over the last months. More gray had appeared in his fashionable salt and pepper beard, but he was in good spirits. He folded himself into the back of the Suzuki, joking that our car might fit into the back of his Rolls Royce Silver Shadow. Yes, yes, very funny. Ellie made her best chicken curry, and we lunched on the terrace. Peter loved it. He didn't speak of New York, and we dared not ask, but he told us how Martin had quit his job, how his daughter had called off the marriage, and that she now was single again. Lizzie cast me a sharp look. I shrugged. I didn't do anything. We reported our business situation, described how Valcura had been writing the now-depressed Great Dane, and talked about all the little problems of life in Africa. To my relief, Ellie didn't embarrass us with her solitary laughing fits, but kept a respectful quiet. After lunch, I took Peter into our office and opened the safe. He smirked at the setup and said, Gotta start somewhere. I handed over the Tafite, my hands slightly trembling. Even with a net value of five billion, Peter disappeared into a different time-space dimension. A boy again, the adventurer exploring unknown worlds. His eyes gleaming as he studied the crystal, turning it this way and that, rolling it on the table and shining the torch through it. I waited patiently, praying he'd share my judgment that this was in fact a Tophite. After a long while, he looked up, beaming, Yes, 
It's a tough fight. Wow. I, the proud deliverer, breathed deep, as promised, a quarter pound. Silently, Peter returned into the other dimension and studied the crystal some more until I felt the time was right to move on. Will you cut it? I asked, bringing the question of ownership into the open. I'm not sure. Peter made a pained face. Look at this perfect crystal. My opinion, too. It won't improve much after cutting. Nothing wrong, but it will look like a big so-so spinel. In the full crystal, it's a miracle. Peter nodded. Yes, I will leave it as it is. We shook hands. After a short walk on the beach, we sat for tea on our terrace, chatting. I had been waiting for an opportunity to talk new business, but Peter didn't need prodding. He came straight to the point without any foreplay. Let me invest in your company. I want to get in early. Lizzie smiled like a honey pie while I tried to stay cool, which, in retrospect, was a silly notion. We don't really have much to show for an evaluation, I warned. Peter smiled, nodding fatherly, got a paper from his pocket, and asked for a pen. Let's see, he tested the ballpoint with some scribble. What's the name of your company? Wild Monkey Gems, I said, and wished I had thought of a more sober name, but that day a monkey had stolen a roof tile, and I thought it was a funny idea. Ellie scowled. I never had bothered to tell her. Luckily, Peter didn't mind at all, but snickered, Okay, let's do some due diligence, shall we? I assume you have all numbers inside that head of yours. I nodded bravely. You sold what? he asked. A sapphire and a sovereite. Total, $445 in sales. Buying price? $200, I said without hesitation, though both stones had been part of messy parcel deals that I could barely reconstruct. Sold during a period of, he asked, well, uh, one week if you want to be positive. Oh yes, I'm all positive, Peter said. How much stock value do you have? Around $210,000 in purchasing prices. He smiled and reached for his telephone to help with the math. He muttered and mumbled while numbers rolled from his pen. We sat like children waiting for the magician to pull the rabbit from his hat. He closed his eyes, muttered some more, scribbled numbers, and then smiled into our tense faces. I think your company has a current value of 1.2 million U.S. dollars. Lizzie, emotionally unrestrained, whooped and pumped her fist. Ellie looked around anxiously as if the wicked monkeys might have overheard the number. Will you sell me 25% of your company at that evaluation? Peter asked. I strained my brain to extract 25% from 1.2, but in my excitement I couldn't have subtracted 5 from 9. Peter helped me out. That'd be $300,000. I become a passive investor. No voting rights. You do as you please. I only want to see the P&L from time to time, perhaps. I pretended to consider, but Lizzie blurted, Of course! Peter stretched out his hand. Lizzie jumped up and hugged him long and hard. Welcome to the Wild Monkey Club, I said. I'll let my M&A team work out the details, Peter said from inside Lizzie's embrace. They'll send you a contract. In the evening, we returned Peter to his hotel. He was scheduled to leave next morning. That night, with 300 k coming up in cash reserves, I slept like a koala bear, until Ellie's curse echoed through dawn. Damn monkey! I'm gonna get myself a shotgun! I was still in bed, but heard the animal dashing over our roof and jumping off into the trees behind our house. We rushed out, and there stood Ellie, helplessly swinging a stick. I was so happy, and now my new begonias! Vancouver was gone, and the wicked monkeys had returned. See? I said to Ellie. Yes, I see, she said thoughtfully, staring at where the monkey had disappeared. Where on earth does he go with my begonias? We stood in silence until Lizzie said, Let's hire a runner, a fast boy, or, or better two. They stay here on guard, and when the next monkey comes, they follow him. Is that possible? I asked. These fellows are awfully fast. So are our boys, Lizzie said. Have you seen who runs first in Olympic track and field? We could try, Ellie nodded. There must be some meaning behind this. Rosalind went to the village. We wanted two boys with quick feet and ambition to earn some extra cash. She returned with Omar and Bakar, thick friends, around ten years old. They agreed to share the prize money of fifty dollars for information on the whereabouts of Ellie's teapot, toilet brush, and begonias. Don't they have to go to school? I asked Rosalind. Yes, but they don't, Rosalind arched her eyebrows. But, well, Kenya has an obligatory education system, right? I realized Rosalind didn't know what obligatory education system meant, but nevertheless, she had a straight answer. To go to school, they need a uniform, but they can't afford that. 
That's why they can't go to school? Because they have no uniform? I asked. Yes, no uniform, no school, Rosalind said. How much are those uniforms? Around one hundred dollars, government issued, Lizzie said. What? One hundred? Are they buying them at Armani? (sighs) No, from the government, Lizzie sighed. Later, when Peter's money came through, we bought them their uniforms. Chapter 7 Omar and Bakar camped on Ellie's veranda, sleeping and eating in turns, waiting for a wicked monkey. Sure enough, on the third day, early afternoon, I heard Ellie's familiar war cry. I rushed from my office to see Omar, followed by his friends, sprinting over the ground and disappearing into the jungle. They were indeed fast. This particular monkey had carried off a small shovel. We hoped the unwieldy loot would slow him down and give the boys a chance to follow. At nightfall, a thoroughly exhausted Omar returned. Basking in our attention, he reported in much detail how they had followed the monkey with the shovel for over two hours. Bakar had given up with a limp, but Omar had endured the final stretch. Good job, I said, and patted his proudly raised head. Child labor in practice. So, where did it go? asked Lizzie impatiently. A Kikau camp, where the hills start. Big Kikuyu family. Kikau Kikuyu. I cast a questioning glance at Lizzie. How would you say Kikau are? Uh, like gypsies, a Kikuyu tribe that moves around, not necessarily poor, but homeless, if, if that's the right word. A nomadic tribe, I suggested. Yes, they trade and move on every few months, don't enjoy a very good reputation. They get chased by the locals, so they make campsites in the wild. We also call them Hamas, something like tent people. Yes, that is where the monkey went, to the Hamas, Omar confirmed. With my shovel? Ellie asked with doubt in her voice. During the afternoon, she had argued the boys would come back with some unverifiable story and claim the fifty bucks. Omar nodded emphatically. Yes, other monkeys there too. Did you see what happened? I asked. Monkey gave the shovel to Waku. Then he got drink. What? A drink from a plastic, uh, big bucket. Woman gave the monkey a drink from the big bucket. Changa'a. I say it was Changa'a. Changa'a is an illegal moonshine. Greetings from hell. Changa'a actually means kill me quick in Swahili. Valkura's mother, remember? I said. She smelled funny. Nobody spoke as we contemplated evil. Lizzie broke the silence. They hooked monkeys on Changa'a and trained them to steal? Her eyes glittered with anger. I hoped she would never look at me like that. Omar got $50 after he promised to A, share it with Bakar, and B, keep quiet about what he had seen, and C, come back at dawn to show us exactly where the camp was. We discussed our options until midnight. Going to the local police carried the risk of getting ourselves into trouble. Unless in deadly need, foreigners are advised to avoid contact with the executive branch in Africa. Also, we feared local police might simply chase those Kikau off their precinct and let them continue their mischief elsewhere, or even worse, go to ask for a bribe and then let them work under police protection. In the end, we decided to follow Ellie's advice and join the hotel manager's monthly meeting to ask for help. Only they had the leverage to get things done here. The next meeting was scheduled in two weeks. Meanwhile, we planned to verify Omar's story. At dawn, we started in the Suzuki, Lizzie and I in the front and Omar in the back. We considered taking Brunhilde for security. She liked driving, and it might have helped her depression, but in the end we decided against it. She was too conspicuous. Ellie stayed behind, too. I don't want to see any more monkeys, thank you. I drove south and then pushed west into the plains. Soon the paved road gave way to gravel, and a little later there was no road at all, only foot tracks. The Suzuki held up well, better than on the road, and though only at walking speed, we rattled along nicely. After an hour of bouncing through open fields, Omar gripped my shoulder. There, the key cow, he whispered and nodded to the front. In a distance stood a cluster of tents inside a little palm tree forest. There was movement. White sheets and clothes flapped in the morning breeze. Children ran and a lump of green metal suggested a vehicle of some sort. I drove on. Soon we drew attention. Men slouching idle under the trees craned their necks. Women stopped working. A few monkeys sleeping on the floor sat up, stared in our direction, and then plunged down again. Kids ran up, screaming. I stopped the car a few dozen paces from the camp. "'What are you doing?' Lizzie hissed. "'Let's go!' 
No, I'm only a silly foreigner. Let me ask for directions. I'm lost. These people are dangerous, Lizzie put her hand on my knee for emphasis. I disregarded Lizzie's warning as tribal prejudice. Yes, these people had trained monkeys to steal, but the drunk youth with the infected eyebrow piercing on the ferry sure had done worse. Come on, I smiled. You picked a fight with a gang in Mombasa, remember? I'll just ask for directions. They won't harm me. Lizzie wanted to contradict, but I turned to Omar and barked for everybody to hear. You're useless! What did I pay you for, huh? I got out, motor running, slammed the door, and marched towards the camp. By now, I had full attention of the clan. The men got up. The smell of rotten fruits and the sharp twang of chemicals hung in the air. A bare-bone pickup truck stood on three wheels in a block of wood. As I came nearer, several men rushed up and formed a line between me and the camp, hindering me from walking on. I peeked over their shoulders but couldn't see any mountains of teapots or toilet brushes. However, I needed no further proof. I looked around. They were a wild bunch, some barely dressed, let alone clean, bloodshot eyes, here and there a limb was missing, their faces showed many scars, though they appeared more curious than unfriendly. Addressing nobody in particular, I asked, "'Can you tell me the way to the main road?' A small fellow in a yellowish undershirt stepped closer with authority. Perhaps he was the waku which Omar had mentioned. His flat nose looked as if the nasal bone had been removed." "'How do we get back to the coast, please?' I asked him again and added in best tourist fashion, "'I go di Ani. Where to di Ani Beach?' The flat nose nodded, not unfriendly, pointed to the east and drew breath. But before he could utter a word, something jumped onto my leg, clawed up my shirt, and began to de-louse me with many tender shack attacks. The key cow stood in dumbfounded surprise while I fought to get Valkura out of my hair.' Then a man pushed through the circle, pointing fingers and shouting. It was the guy I had seen on the beach weeks before. He was obviously deciphering the meaning of our visit for his clan, motioning at Valcura and our car. My disguise as a lost tourist was blown sky high. Faces turned ugly. Behind, the Suzuki's motor revved. Lizzie must have climbed into the driver's seat, getting ready for an attack rescue mission. I turned and split without a word, first in a gentlemanly stride, then breaking into a run while a noisy argument ensued behind me. Valkura's claws ripped into my shoulder. The Suzuki bounced into my direction. Omar nearly fell off as Lizzie crashed into a circle and then to a halt, the exhaust pipe pointing towards the camp. I jumped into the car. Valkura changed to Lizzie's shoulder, chattering happily. I looked back. Several men had picked up heavy sticks and one held a panga, an African machete, but they stood undecided, gesticulating and arguing. Haraka! Haraka! Omar begged. Lizzie rammed in the gear. The motor howled and then died. With a plop, plop, plop. Silence. Lizzie cursed and turned the key. No reaction. Not even a battery-induced whining. Lizzie tried again. Nothing. Omar, with the initiative and spontaneity of the young, jumped from the car and ran at full speed. Though he was fast, the key cows might have been able to catch him, but at that time they still lacked active decision-making. We grown-ups sat in silence. Only Valkura shack attackered noisily. Lizzie turned the key. Again, nothing happened. Lizzie looked at me. Not nice. I shrugged. Yeah, yeah, yes, it was my fault, but, well, nobody's perfect. Chapter 8 Soon after, the car was encircled by sturdy men and many kids. Some women came running up as well. I dropped my hand to feel for the Japanese blade inside my sleeve. It was there all right, but not much of a help against twenty men with clubs and machetes and what else they might have inside their camp. However, they didn't hack us to pieces straight away. Murdering foreigners is not done lightly, at least not in Kenya. Founder of Internet Company killed on safari it doesn't go down well in the newspapers, and international police would come after them, even across borders. At the sight of the surrounding clan, Valkura gave up being happy and began to whimper. A few brave men stepped in front of the car as Lizzie gave the motor a final try, but the Suzuki ignored our pleading. I waited for Lizzie to talk us out of it, but she just stared into the distance with a, You brought us here, so do something face. Who speaks English? I asked into the crowd, trying not to sound scared nor condescending. Flat nose growled. May I? I motioned to get out of the car. They stepped aside. Addressing Flatnose, I said, We know what you're doing. Flatnose waggled his head, raised his eyebrows. So what? Others murmured angrily. The Waku was not the only English speaker. 
But we're stuck. Oh, okay. Bad luck for us. Good for you, I admitted. Flatnose nodded with a nasty grin, but didn't comment. Look, look, we don't care about monkeys, except that small one, I motioned towards Valkura. We want to take him home, and we'll leave you in peace. Won't talk about it anymore. I waited for a reaction, but since none came forth, I continued. You can do what you want, but you better move on. This opened up negotiations. Flatnose pulled a dangerous face and growled, Why is that? Well, too many people know of your business by now. They know we came here and the boy ran back home. Our friends will come. Some people do care for monkeys, you know. And many people do care for their teapots, too. Lizzie sat stoically as if she were just the driver, but I knew she was listening closely. Flatnose pondered my arguments. Translations made the round, a discussion began, opinions were aired, disputed and acknowledged, all with increasing volume and emotion, culminating into a most unpleasant African turmoil. By then, the whole clan was present. Men shouted with frantic gesticulations, waved their sticks and pongas. Women wailed with frightened faces, first trying to pull their husbands away, and then their children. I feared the worst, but before things got out of control, Flatnose, who had not participated in the chaos but had been standing still, his forehead wrinkled in deep thought, raised his hands, shouted once, twice, and a relative quiet fell. You have to come with me, he said, and nodded at Lizzie. You too. Leave the key in the car. Without hesitation, Lizzie got out of the Suzuki, and they marched us into their camp. Valkura hid deep inside Lizzie's shirt, clever enough to stay quiet. Flatnose commanded us to sit under a tree in front of an extinguished cooking place and walked off with a mobile phone stuck to his head. Out of earshot, he talked and gesticulated, staring at the Suzuki and then back in our direction. Three men watched over us, as they must have seen in a Hollywood movie. A small and fat man in boxer shorts and one tall fellow with a sarong held heavy sticks. The third, a small wiry man with a kind of ponytail, threatened us with a blunt-looking panga. Lizzie. I began to whisper, but the ponytail stuck the panga in my face and snarled, No talking! In any case, Lizzie was sulking, ignoring me and everybody else. Sweating and thirsty, I comforted myself with the thought that sooner or later somebody would come and rescue us. All the while, Flatnose alternatively barked orders into the camp or made and received a flurry of calls. The monkeys had woken too, chattering in low tones. They waited for a woman distributing small portions of changa'a from a big plastic barrel. The whole camp was on its feet. Finally, I connected their activities. They were breaking tent, moving on. Flatnose wasn't stupid. He was getting ready to vanish into some other lawless part of the country, or perhaps across the nearby border to Tanzania. Okay, I thought, we'll have an unpleasant time sitting here and waiting to be rescued. Probably I'd get an earful from Lizzie, not my favorite Sunday pastime, but survivable. But then a big shiny car came rumbling over the fields. Flatnose stopped talking on his phone and briskly walked towards the newcomers. Our guards drew closer, making sure we wouldn't get up or raise attention. I glanced at Lizzie. No reaction. I craned my neck. It was a brand new Toyota double cab, uplifted on monster tires with naked double wide flatbed, tented windows, winch, and various extras. The massive truck made a circle and stopped a few meters left to our Suzuki. Two middle-aged African men with huge pot bellies, obviously brothers, heaved from the car, motor running. Flatnose greeted the two with business-like handshakes, and together they began to examine our Suzuki. I paled. I groaned. Flatnose was selling our car. Suddenly our situation looked much more serious. I searched for somebody digging graves. Not yet. Not here. Perhaps they were planning to take us as hostages, across the border. I had heard similar stories, none with happy endings. Could we make a dash for the car dealers? If so, what then? People buying stolen rental cars without papers would probably not protect the very tourists the car was stolen from. Now I really wanted to talk with Lizzie. I glanced sideways, and this time she reacted, barely perceptible, just a sideways blink of her eyes. She had understood. We were a team again, and I felt much better. To Lizzie's feet lay a heavy frying pan. She moved her foot an inch towards the grip of the pan. I nodded a very slow, understood. Our guards paid no attention to details. I looked around. The two car dealers now sat in our Suzuki, which naturally wouldn't start. Flatnose had opened its hood and stood leaning into the motor. You may remember from Madagascar that Lizzie was a semi-professional squash player. She had exceptionally fast and precise reflexes and considerable strength. 
Thus, it was worth watching how she gripped the frying pan with both hands, swinging it in a full circle while simultaneously rising to her feet and in one smooth movement, backhanded the man with the panga over his ponytail. He went down with a oof. I might have been worried about his head if there had been time for compassion, but Lizzie swung again, this time at the small fat man. She missed his head but whacked hard into his left shoulder. The fat man howled and raised the stick with his right hand. Meanwhile, I had pulled the knife from my sleeve and flicked it open. Just as the man whacked down on Lizzie, I grabbed him from behind, pulling backwards and pressing the knife deep into his double chin, albeit with the blunt side of the blade. Thus, his stroke lost some strength, but nevertheless knocked Lizzie on the head. She tumbled. Blood burst from a gash on her forehead. Behind us, the third tall man screamed red alarm. Before I could turn, his stick swished through the air and my neck fired up in pain. Nothing was broken. There was no nausea. Only anger. I yanked my man around, escaping the next savage blow, but nearly losing the grip on the knife and my hostage. But then Lizzie had recovered and flew at the tall man. The frying pan slammed sideways into his stomach and immediately afterwards crashed square onto his head. I can't explain how Lizzie executed this double stroke so quickly, but down he went. Lizzie dropped the pan and snatched up the panga lying next to the bleeding ponytail. My hostage whimpered nicely, making no attempt to resist or flee whatsoever. Almost playfully, Lizzie swung the panga through the air, the blade too fast for the eye to perceive. Blunt or not, it made a frightful noise. The panga must have been just as long and heavy as a squash racket, for Lizzie wielded it with perfect ease as if she'd trained panga fighting all her life. Bleeding from the temple, she looked truly fierce. No doubt whoever stepped into that panga swing would be cut down like a young papaya tree. Many men now surrounded us, shouting and jumping, forming a circle, but keeping a safe distance from Lizzie. Even the monkeys followed the show with excitement. For a moment, I was afraid the animals might attack us, because that would have been our end. But they just looked on, apparently not considering the Hamas to be part of their rot. I glanced over my shoulder. Flatnose was still buried deep under the Suzuki's hood. Our escape plan was obvious, without deliberation. Back to back, we pushed towards the cars, me in the rear dragging my hostage by his fat throat and Lizzie in the front swinging her panga in a horizontal eight and at anybody who dared to come closer. A rock hit me between the ribs. I had hurt badly and anger flared. I dug the knife's back deep into my man's double chin, tempted even to turn the blade. He squealed terribly. Another stone swished just over Lizzie's head. A chubby small woman, probably my hostage's sister, assailed the stone thrower with her fist, screaming. No more stones came flying, only curses, shouts of revenge, and anger. Then Flatnose came running, white spots on his dark skin. The two car dealers, oblivious to the row in the camp, sat in the Suzuki, gesticulating lively, perhaps happy to discuss the deal without Flatnose. Three men rushed to their Waku's side, and together they stood on the camp's edge, bravely blocking our path to the cars. Lizzie stopped, hesitated a moment, and then dove into a long-legged forward step, slashing the ponga only inches past the men's knees. Even a simple squash racket would have shattered their bones, and with her reach, Lizzie could easily have added a few inches. She was straight up on her feet, the ponga ready to strike again before the men had time to react. Lizzie snarled in Swahili. The Waku and his men tumbled back and sideways, clearing our line to the cars. Flatnose glanced at the car dealers, obviously considering whether to warn them or not, and then deciding against it. Good choice, I thought. After all, he was a clever guy. I'll get the car, Lizzie hissed. Before I could ask for more detail, she was gone. I tightened the grip on my hostage and swung around. With a savage shout, Lizzie jumped between the Toyota and our dead Suzuki. Stay! Don't move! She yelled and underlined her threat with a swing of the panga, grazing past the Suzuki's open window. The two car dealers gawked at the sword-swinging, bleeding Amazonia, looking at each other, then back at Flatnose, who stood helplessly a few paces behind, and shrugged. If the two brothers were armed, they must have left their weapons in the Toyota, since they just sat there, dumbfounded. I kept on moving, grimacing fiercely, I imagine, and snarling. My man squealed again and again. 
The chubby sister flung herself at Flatnose's knees, wailing and crying. Flatnose tried to free himself from her, yelled, probably commanding her to shut up, which she didn't until somebody dragged her away. Lizzie jumped into the Toyota's driver's seat, slammed the door, and revved the motor. The car dealers, finally realizing what was going to happen, cursed and tumbled from the Suzuki as fast as their overweight would allow and ran to block Lizzie's path. She let the motor howl frightfully. The brothers swore at her, stamped their feet, and picked up rocks, but then hesitated to damage their own beloved car. Flatnose barked at them. Fuming with anger, the two yelled back and at one another, but finally stepped aside. As I reached the back of the truck, I slid onto the flatbed, balancing my hostage with me, and heaved him up to sit partly on my lap, partly on the edge of the truck, his short feet dragging through the sand. He was very cooperative now, desperately trying to minimize the pressure of the cold steel on his throat. Again, the motor roared. Lizzie opened the driver's door and yelled, Ready? I assumed she couldn't see well through the tinted back windows and didn't know which button to use for the Toyota's electric window, so she had to open the door. Slowly! I screamed. We began to move, first in walking pace, then carefully accelerating to running speed. The clan followed, keeping the pace for a while, but the two dealers, not used to running, trailed behind. After a minute or two, Flatnose stopped running, and with dignity, admitted his defeat. Everybody stood still watching, except for the two car dealers, who tried to attack Flatnose but were stopped by the clan, themselves fuming with anger and spoiling for action. The yelling started again, only now we heard less and less as Lizzie put distance between us and the camp. A half mile onwards, Lizzie stopped. She opened her door, leaned out and called, Let him go! I would have preferred to take the guy with us, just in case, but I didn't dare to argue with her just then. Lizzie would have her reasons. Carefully extracting my knife from the man's double chin, I shoved him off the truck. He fell with a cry, slumped to his knees, and howled dramatically. With one hand, I folded my knife. With the other, I searched for a secure holding on the truck bed. Let's go, I called to the front. Okay, Lizzie closed her door. Later, I googled the different models of these Toyota pickup trucks. This particular car had the big V8 motor, 5,000 cc of gasoline, and 220 horsepower, simultaneously drilling four off-road tires deep into the ground. Lizzie wasn't used to such motors, nor did her emotional state and our situation encourage meek driving. She floored the pedal. The Toyota exploded forward like a striking snake, catapulting me into the air. And when I came down, the car had disappeared beneath, and I slammed into the sand not far from my ex-hostage. Lizzie sprayed us with gravel and sand. Before I could scramble to my feet and holler, Lizzie was out of earshot, deep inside her closed cabin, deafened by eight roaring cylinders and occupied with reckless off-road driving. My ex-hostage swung around. It took the man a moment to transcend from poor victim to angry revenger. Considering the circumstances, he did a fine job. His eyes glared as he stomped at me with arms outstretched, ready to throttle. A shout went up from the campsite. Sprinting does not count amongst the common qualifications of a gym trader, but if I ever ran fast, <laughs> it was then, screaming and flailing my arms after Lizzie. I didn't glance back, but could hear my ex-hostage panting and cursing close behind too close. While I fumbled for the knife, he tackled into my knees and hurled me straight into an unwelcoming thorn bush. Wasting no time with formalities, he immediately began pounding me with his fists, albeit with poor aim, doing little harm. Despite his girth, I got my knees pulled up and kicked him off like an unwanted lover. He flew a good meter and landed on his back with a pained grunt. Lizzie had finally noticed her loss and turned back in a dangerously tight circle, the inner wheels barely touching the ground. I jumped to my feet, dazed. By now, the whole clan, women, children, and even some monkeys were on the move into our direction. The first men, only a hundred meters off, swinging sticks and pongas. Luckily, I wore strong sneakers that day. Havana's would have been my end. I concentrated on running. Lizzie came back, in a straight line, but not towards me. Instead, she was aiming at the clan behind. I glanced back as the Toyota thundered by. Some men wavered, some stopped, but others fanned out, continuing to run at full speed but in a wider formation. The women turned to chase their children into the camp. My ex-hostage had lost ground and energy. Fear runs faster than anger. Also, he was limping. Lizzie swung out into another wide circle, nearly mowing down one of the front runners. Rocks crashed against the Toyota. A heavy stick dodged from the windscreen, but nothing could have stopped these three tons of steel. My lungs on fire, I, I ran on, away from the havoc Lizzie was creating behind. 
I heard her turn and follow. Then she was slowing alongside. This time I ignored the flatbed, yanked the passenger door open, and jumped in. A final rock clattered onto the roof, and we were gone. Lizzie hammered the Toyota over the plane, not even looking back. Valcura shack attackered happily. I laughed and cursed and cried. Final Chapter On the main road, we stopped at a kiosk, washed and nursed our wounds. Lizzie insisted that I disinfect her wound with local rum. She howled as alcohol and blood dribbled down her cheeks in a purple sauce. We drank the rest of the rum with warm Coca-Cola, ate a portion of Ugali Ugali, and then continued towards the coast. Near Diani, we came upon a convoy of cars racing into the opposite direction. A police car, two hotel jeeps, and a private car with a Great Dane's head drooling through the back window. Lizzie turned and followed, honking until the caravan noticed us and stopped. Omar and Bakar were there, and Ellie. In few words, we explained what had happened. The police and the hotel security moved on, but Ellie and Brunhilde returned home with us. In the car, Valcura lovingly groomed and pretended to delouse the dog, constantly chattering in a low voice as if telling his story, while Brunhilde happily slobbered all over the monkey. When the police arrived at the campsite, they found only the two car dealers sitting in our Suzuki. The Kikau were gone for good. They had left behind many tents, material, and also their Chenga'a distiller. The poor monkeys had followed them anyways. A few days later, we freed the car dealers from jail and returned their slightly damaged Toyota, agreeing to mutual silence in face of the authorities. They had not tried to buy a stolen rental, and we had not taken their car by force. The security manager of the Diani Reef and the police promised to track the gang, but nothing came from it in our time. Everybody assumed the Kikau had left for Tanzania. Doing business in Kenya continued to be a pita, and in the same year, Lizzie and I moved on. We left Ellie, Brunhilde, and Valcura with heavy hearts, but in good shape. Peter never regretted his investment, and the 133-gram Tophite crystal is envied by collectors worldwide. The End Book 2 Visit edwardbristol.com